Mother, tell your nipples not to poke my way. Tell your nipples not to hear my words, what they mean, what they say. Mother, E-Rich, did you go see this fucking film? Did the normies in the audience cry? And did they ask, why did I see this? da 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 Hey everybody, I'm Danzig. Welcome to the Mother Podcast, and I am joined by um, re- regretful normie audience member. <laughs> Woo! Oh, was that good? Am I am yeah, I a professional that was great. singer now? What you, do you should know? change change professions, my dude. Uh, <laughs> I've been working on it ever since I got into this shit. The audience looking did for a not... way out at every corner. <laughs> the audience did not scream. They did not cry. They laughed. Oh, did they? Yes. There what were giggles. Know? There were giggles on the way out of the theater. Okay, E. Rich, we saw, we saw Mother, the mm-hmm. latest film by extraordinary filmmaker, uh, what's his name? Darren Aronofsky. And let me just be the first to say that Mother is one of the greatest practical jokes I've seen <laughs> in recent time. Mm-hmm. Because... You make a film with this great marketing campaign saying it's the scariest thing you'll ever see. You It'll change your life. You'll be haunted forever. And then you you slap in Jennifer Lawrence, like the number one no- normie magnet of all of the, of the acting world, like the highest paid actress out there these days. Little fucking Kat, Katniss Everdeen, all, all the little teenagers want to go see it. Like, oh man, a scary movie with Hunger Games girl in it? Oh, hell yeah. And then they sit, they have to sit through this film and it's like... <laughs> It's really just like a, like a weird art house film, and it's not like this horror film at all. And they 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 had to sit through it, and then at the end, um, I felt <laughs> embarrassed for the audience because everybody was Ooh. looking around at each other like, "Okay, we just got fucking punk." <laughs> I mean, I think audience, not audiences. I think uh, the marketing teams have been doing this lately. They've got a either well regarded filmmaker who's going to make a very strange movie, and so. They, they, the studio has sunk thirty million in this case, thirty million dollars into this movie, and then uh, they're going to ask audiences, "Hey, go on this fucking weird ride with this filmmaker <laughs> and this very famous actress." Yeah. Uh, it's not going to work if you market it as the movie that it is. Nobody's going to fucking go see it. So the marketing team has to really play up certain elements, make it seem like a scary movie. It's hilarious to me because during the trailers, I saw the first two trailers for this movie. I think the first one was really well done. It was basically just her walking through the house uh, with very little... Very suspenseful, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very little idea of what the movie would actually be, and I loved that one. The second one gave a little bit more away, even though it's really hard to give anything away in this movie. But uh, Mm -hmm. the audiences loved the trailers. Like, basically, as soon as the trailers were done, people were, like, whispering to each other saying, ooh, that looks good, or I want to see that. Uh, and so, I want to just give you a snapshot of what I saw before I went into this movie. The and couple... real quick, just as a precursor to this conversation, should we do a spoiler-free talk in case we convince people to go see it, or should we go into spoilers? Because, personally, I don't want to. I don't want to say okay. exactly what the movie is. I think it's going to be hard to talk about this movie either way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If That's we true. say we're not going to spoil anything, uh, what we can talk about becomes very, very subjective. And then if we say we are going to spoil it, what we talk about will sound like nonsense to anyone who. <laughs> yeah. Well. Who's going to? The opinion to this. that I that I want to put forth is not uh, dependent on spoil spoiling the film. Mm-hmm. So that's why I leave it up to you. But go ahead and say what you were about to say. All right. All right. So the couple behind me, while I was buying my ticket for this movie could not decide what they wanted to see tonight. Who the fuck goes to the movies not knowing what they're going to see? This this is something that I very much hate in general audiences is basically they either have no idea what's playing and they just want to they they just decide <laughs> they, they want to see the, the movie theater at a random fucking time yes. and hope and yes. break cross their fingers that there's a movie playing that isn't sold out. Are you fucking kidding me? Or they go to see a fucking particular normies. movie. Get the fuck out of my I know. theater. I know. <laughs> Did you read them? I wish I could have. Uh, I didn't oh, want to I reveal my power level. Who you? What? Nobody. My my own humility. Um. So <laughs> they either do that, where they have no idea what they want to see, or they do know what they want to see, but they care so little <laughs> that they will instantly change their mind <laughs> regardless. Yeah. So this couple behind me wanted to go see Girls Trip, 
which... Is that still playing? Yes, I mean, at least at the theater Shit. I was at, which could not be farther away from this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the woman in the couple was like, oh, that mother movie. I saw a trailer for that. You oh. want to see that? And I think the boyfriend was like basically not having any of it, but just really wasn't interested in putting up a fight. So they ended up seeing Mother. <laughs> That's a good way to convince people to never go to the movies again. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like the one time they go, like, oh, that's, that looks pretty good. And then it's like, it's not for them at all. But I mean, like, oh, they... well, may maybe we should just uh, stay home and watch Netflix next but time. But they have to know that, like, that's basically like playing Russian roulette. You're either <laughs> you're either not going to die or you're going to die. Let me let me put this out there, and we'll see how you agree. Because I I saw some of your your rave reviews on yeah. social media, and I was like, oh, okay. So we're on kind of different kind of different uh, wavelengths over here. Okay. I would argue, I would argue in a positive way that this is not a movie, and this is not a film. This is a living nightmare in, <laughs> yeah. in the best possible way. It, it it has no coherence. It doesn't really have a plot. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't. I would argue that most of the characters aren't even actual characters. They're like projections of a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Because I've had this nightmare before. The nightmare of like no nobody has any um, consistency in like the people you're interacting with, and like they're all behaving in weird, strange ways. Yeah. And just like you, you lose control, and you're like you feel claustrophobic, and you're in, in an environment where where things are happening that you you can't stop, no matter how bad you want. Like I've had this specific nightmare many times, mm -hmm. and I was reliving it watching the film. So I I feel like it's very successful in in evoking that sensation and feeling of being in like a terrible fucking nightmare mm -hmm. but as a film like as a movie with a plot and characters i think it fails on every level but as an experience i think that i definitely would want to watch especially the second half again yeah oh definitely so basically as someone who uh goes to art house movies or wants to see different things in theaters I absolutely love this just because, like, basically the more you see more movies and the more you uh, take in what we consider Kino at times. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I would say this is Nightmare Kino for sure. <clears throat> oh, definitely, definitely. You start to want to experience feelings or get experiences rather than go in for, like, deep character pieces or... A story. Yeah, a story. So if a, if a filmmaker can build sequences and can build... Uh, tension in a scene even if it doesn't really make sense on a like intensely personal character way as long as that tension has worked on you and you've had like because basically this movie has several scenes where people in a house are disrespecting the house and uh the person who owns the house and has worked on the house can't do anything to stop them yeah uh, it's upsetting like it just it, it reminds yeah. you of parts of like your own life where you like have friends over or, like throw a party and they're, they're getting too rowdy but in this world they won't fucking stop and they won't leave yeah and I, yeah. I could i could feel like a sickness inside me like oh god this movie's making me sick please mm -hmm. make this stop yeah exactly if you can feel that the movie has worked and yeah. to me that means it's a good movie like basically uh there are several readings you can put onto this film that i think make it uh really interesting to think about and pour over the first is a simple biblical allegory yeah see that that pissed mm -hmm. me off why? right when why? we got home right when we get home sheep over is like oh man I, I just realized you know there's, there's locusts and and toads and the and the death of a firstborn child it's like the the plagues and i'm like Sh shut the fuck up <laughs> shut, every, shut the fuck up not just her but everybody mm -hmm. throwing allegories and symbolism into a film doesn't mean fucking anything does this no, movie have anything does, to say about those things you're just fucking doing it to like pretend to be deep and smart when it's just like stupid come on but you, what's you, the fucking point you literally have a son killing another son in this movie a direct you, Cain and Abel okay parallel. so so you ripped off bible stories and threw it in your <laughs> film what do i get out of that but it, it's, why it, do i care the difference is so if you go if you play into the biblical allegory that would make jennifer lawrence earth okay so god javier Bardem created earth which is this kind of perfect thing an inspiration. Jennifer Lawrence is taking care of this house, and as uh, Ed Harris and Michelle Pfeiffer 
are Adam and Eve. They come into this place and start disrespecting it. They're not the the pure things. I mean, they're fans of Javier Bardem in the movie. And yeah. Adam and Eve were like these perfect things that became more flawed and were less godly than this perfect idea. And then basically as humanity goes and goes and goes, it gets more depraved, more terrible to the point where they're completely disrespecting this initial thought and like the the pure ideas like basically so Javier Bardem is like this poet and so all of these people come to praise the poem like and basically as they move in and start to destroy the earth or destroy the world around them uh you just get an idea that they've they've taken this pure thing and they've just ruined it and it comes to the point where she gives birth to this child and, like, you know, Javier Bardem is not going to do something good with that child. And <laughs> I'm not going to reveal what happens, but it is sickening. I, oh, like, I already said that the it's the death, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, uh... Yeah, okay, shit. so, yeah, we, okay, we get it. You, you have a one-to-one correlation with between your story and, like, Bible shit. But, like, mm-hmm. okay, does that make it a good movie? Like, does that I, make I it intelligent? I think it does, because you look at it from Why? the point of view of Earth. The Bible does not look at things from the point of view of Earth. The Bible is very man man centric. It, it's based on humanity's struggles. But if you look at this movie from the point of Mother Nature or the point of the world around us, which gave us life, which gave us purpose, and we've repeatedly abused it and ruined it, and now we're trying to find a way to renew it. I think I think there's another reading here, which is basically the creative process, and uh, that Jennifer Lawrence could be like the muse or the like basically directors will take on female kind of uh muses or something like that and then the end of the movie where she's replaced by another woman uh by the end is basically yeah. symbolic of you f- you find another woman to get you that that solid crystal idea of what you want yeah, to do yeah so so based on that ending mm-hmm. if we if we want to look at the the fucking bible allegory so what the the point of the allegory is when earth is destroyed god will just start over and make a new one I mean, like it's, it sounds like it's on the side of God there. It, it could very easily be a uh, flood yeah. idea. So instead of flood, it's fire in the movie. So so what what, what do I learn? What's this fucking... This, <laughs> I mean, this Kino educational film, what's it trying to teach me about God and Earth? Um, that it's a deeply fucked up relationship between man and God. Uh, <laughs> that we will we will ruin pure things because that's our natural mood. I think there's a lot of great stuff about religion in this movie that it can like lead people into being animals basically. <laughs> and like like it, it it I think it it to a point falls apart uh if you think about it in certain respects in the movie. I'm not I'm like I I think this movie will be poured over and looked at again and again, but the experience it sends you on by putting you in the mindset of whatever her fucking character is called jennifer lawrence's uh, i think it just says like in the in the script i think it's either mother or mother Earth, yeah. or, or her or some shit like that i don't remember mm-hmm. yeah I, I think if you just look at the events of this film through her lens which is kind of like what you do anyway uh yeah. you get an a unique aspect of you've put all of this work into something you've slaved your entire life hoping that like you'd have peace between you and another being and because of him he introduces all these fucking things to ruin it and butcher it and it becomes bullshit and so by the end she's just like screaming and like it's it's horrific but i i i just think on that level it works for me and that's all i really ask for movies is that introduce ideas introduce concepts give me feelings throughout that like whether it's claustrophobia whether it's just i i I just don't want to be in this situation I can feel for the characters. As long as they do that, I'm over the moon. And because Darren Aronofsky is a very talented filmmaker who knows how to shoot things and knows how to build up tension, it absolutely works for me. So, Yeah, I'd say on the, the level of putting me on an emotional thrill ride and, mm-hmm. and a level of great tension and like I, I'm kind of on the edge of my seat absorbed into the craziness of the film, it works for me. Mm-hmm. I, I think all the alle- allegory stuff is fucking stupid. Okay. I, I hate it. Um you're like allowed just, you're allowed to think yeah. that and then the other thing is th- this is not some kind of normie filter where uh regular people won't get it uh and only only the best people understand it people who yeah. are perfectly intelligent can look at what's being 
thrown out and say, this is fucking bullshit. Fuck you, Darren Aronofsky. And I think that can be a perfectly legitimate argument. It's basically like, this is very... And I think, I think in my case, it just might be that I don't care. Like, uh, I, okay. I don't care about your biblical allegory. I don't... <laughs> I just... I can't fathom giving a fuck about your characters representing like god and shit yeah like, yeah c come up with something else come, we've seen it before <laughs> i've seen it i'm pretty sure in the last two thousand years they've done this about a thousand times mm -hmm. so l let's do something new darren you fuck <laughs> fucking hack hey, it, let's talk about the yeah. the actors in the film real quick before we before we lose all the listeners with this fucking allegory shit yeah um i saw a really funny interview where uh Jennifer Lawrence was she was either on Jimmy Kimmel or, or Jimmy Fallon or one of those and she says uh, the, the scariest part of the film for her father was that her nipples are exposed in the film <laughs> and I, I, I was just like okay nobody tell him no nobody tell poor Jennifer Lawrence's father the truth mm -hmm. I don't think he's gonna be able to handle it yep. he has no idea that poor soul yeah um, if you if you had a famous sexy daughter who had needs uh, nudes leaked would you take a look? No. <laughs> God, no. Well, come on, you know you would. God, no. If Jennifer Lawrence was my daughter, I'd be like, well, shit, I saw her naked when she was a baby. What's the difference now? You know what I'm saying? She is someone's daughter, monkey. <laughs> yeah, oh, your daughter. Fuck, in this all scenario. women are someone's daughter. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, nah, I'd fuck Jennifer Lawrence if she was my daughter, but not, not otherwise. <laughs> only only not if she was otherwise. my daughter. Only. I'll tell you what, uh, anybody with a pregnancy fetish, this movie's going to do it for them. <laughs> Especially oh, if they want to see uh, Jennifer Lawrence pregnant. Or if you, uh, is this the first time she actually exposed her breasts in a film? I think it might be, unless it was like a stunt double somehow. I don't know, but man. Get on Mr. There's, Skin there's if you want to know that. <laughs> she, there's a scene where she's getting the shit beat out of her. Yeah. So, like, the only oh, time oh, you can that actually... was rough. Jesus. Yeah. Like, the only time you can actually see her exposed boobs in the film is when she's, mm. like, all bloody and beaten. So they, it ruins it for you. You can't even enjoy it unless I you're mean, into that sort of thing. She's in that she... practically clear nighty, so, uh... Yeah. Yeah, So you, you get a good idea at the beginning of the film. Mm -hmm. But really, that's that's all I had to say. I really like Ed Harris. Um, oh, I yeah. didn't know who Michelle, Michelle Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer was. Yeah. Um, And then Javier Bardem, like, he just... Ed Harris and Javier Bardem played so well into the idea of of it being like a, a nightmare scenario where like there's no consistency and like you mm -hmm. don't understand these people's actions and why they're doing everything wrong to you and like, yeah they're just trying to understand and, and do something else so uh i think they were really successful at pulling that off i think for what she had to do in this movie jennifer lawrence did a great fucking job uh i've i've really disliked her in the last couple years in the fucking x-men movies uh, I yeah. think she's actively gotten worse in the Hunger Games movies, uh, but I think that's more down to the movies themselves than her in particular. But uh, yeah, I really liked her here. Javier Bardem is just great. Everything I've seen him in, he he does a great job of. He he can be very settling and like reassuring, and then like all he has to do is raise the tenor of his voice. And all of a sudden, you're fucking scared out of your mind, Adam. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so wasn't that him great. in Sicario? Do I remember that correctly? No, nah, no, nah, it's a Benicio del Toro. Ah, okay. Yeah, both fine Mexican actors. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Colombian. Who fucking Middle knows? Eastern. I, I'm Spanish? pretty sure Benicio del Toro is Mexican. I'm not sure. Yeah, about, he's of the bull. He must Javier be Mexican. Bardem. Harvey or Bardem could be Spanish. I'm not sure. Hmm. Well, that's pretty much all I had to say about Mother, so if you have any more uh, shit to spill... Yeah, ahead. real quick. Uh, I've really loved Darren Aronofsky's work in the past couple of years. He made a movie called uh, Noah, which is a direct biblical fucking take on the uh, Genesis portion where Noah is fucking building the ark and shit. That's not the uh, Russell Crowe movie, is it? It is. It is the Russell oh. Crowe movie. Yeah, I was disappointed because they didn't show Emma Watson's tits, and I, I really want to see those tits. You really wanted that. What the fuck, uh, Emma? I really liked Noah because there were rock monsters in it, and I yeah, it was rock like Transformers, monsters. but with rock monsters that were angels. Yeah, they and and what's what's interesting to me is uh, it's very clear that Darren Aronofsky at least uh, respects the Bible as some form of like interesting uh, lesson for humanity, and there's a lot of similarities in the scenes where the people are 
acting like animals in this movie as there was in Noah, where you see the masses of humanity and how evil they are uh, and wicked. And so I just, all of those scenes in both movies really affect me and make me wonder whether this is really what humanity is. But uh, he, he likes to make movies about people who are obsessed about things. And that just, I, I love that. So I, I'd say Mother is a combination of Stop Black Stop banging Swan. whatever you're banging over there. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. I'm fiddling with my phone case. So, you nervous fuck. <laughs> um, yeah, so Mother is a combination of Noah, Black Swan, and fuck. One of his other movies. Oh, The Fountain. Uh, that's a fucking a crazy one. But uh, I love all of those movies. I love what Dar- Darren Aronofsky sits down. Uh, I think there's a lot to think about. He challenges his audience. I'd rather see Mother than most of the Hollywood schlock that gets put out. And I'm just happy that a studio will give him money. Not, <laughs> I guess, not expect to return. I, I think that there are some uh, some directors that studios just say, get us an Oscar or get us something award worthy. And it doesn't have to make back its budget. This movie will not make back its budget. It was made for $30 million. It made $3 million this weekend. Shit. Uh, it'll be lucky it if it gets full. five total. So uh, we <laughs> shall see. But, yeah, I, I just enjoy seeing movies like this that make me feel something and put me on that ride. So, yeah, see it if you want to be challenged. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I'd, I'd probably recommend seeing it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure who to... But I don't regret seeing it, and okay. uh, especially, like, the first half is very, like, creepy, and you're like, oh, I don't feel so good. And then the second half, I like, you don't know if you're awake or not. It's, it's fucking berserk. Okay. Javier Bardem is Spanish, and Benicio Del Toro is Puerto Rican. Well, I guess we're both racist. I, I, think, I think that's true. Thanks, Jennifer <laughs> Lawrence. <laughs> All right, folks, that, that was Mother... Uh, next time we'll go see uh, Kingsman 2. That'll Fuck be yeah. much more fun. Let's hope <laughs> there's more real jokes. Film. Yeah, baby! Oh! <laughs> Mother, tell your movie not to be pretentious schlock. <laughs> tell your movie that God is a fag and the earth is a drag. Mother. Oh, man, that was good. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, I'm cutting it there.